Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, and what I'm planning, is this working? Yep. Um, to talk tonight a little bit around the idea of this book, my second recent book called A Richer You, which is a whole lot of stories. Those of you who, who reads my Weekend Herald column? Most of you, or some of you do anyway. It's a Q&A column for those of you who don't. And when you read it, it's, the thing that's appealing, I think, is, is that it's about real people's stories and, and quite often um, behaviour that's not necessarily optimal it's because they're being people. So, so that's, um, I'll come back to stories from the book as, as we go through tonight. Um, there's just a couple of points I want to make from this list here of, of um, why I'm up here talking to you. Um, the, the, I'm a director of Financial Services Complaints Limited. Does anyone know fiscal that we, we call it? No, and it's shocking that so few New Zealanders know. Some of you will have heard of the Banking Ombudsman Scheme, I'm sure. That's been around for longer. I used to be on the board of that, actually, and now I'm on the board of this one. Um, the Banking Ombudsman's been around about for about 30 years, so if you have any problems with any bank and you can't get it resolved, you're not happy <coughs> with the way the bank left it with you, you can go free to the Banking Ombudsman and they listen to your side, <coughs> they listen to their side, and they often award, sometimes they award money to you, sometimes they award letters of apology, which are amazingly powerful for people sometimes. Um, and it only takes a few weeks, usually, usually. And 10 or so years ago, maybe more like 12 now, the government said, okay, we want these similar disputes resolution schemes for every financial organisation. And so there are three others. There's Banking Ombudsman, and then we're one of the three others that does disputes. So we, Fiscal's members include KiwiSaver providers and insurance companies and stockbrokers and all of that. So if you ever have a problem with anybody, and you're just not happy with how things have been resolved, go to these places. They're free and they're, you don't need a lawyer or anything. They just listen to your side of the story. And I just wish more New Zealanders knew they were there. A lot of you might, might not have a problem yourselves, but your neighbour does or your friend does. So just know that's there. The other point I just want to make is I'm not a financial advisor. People often think I am. I'm a journalist. And I, so I'm not selling any, quite a lot of times you go along to seminars from people who are wanting to actually sign you up to become one of their clients or get you into some kind of investment scheme. I'm just a journalist. I'm, I'm, I'm on your side, honestly. I'm not trying to pitch anything. Um, so looking at investment mistakes, I want to look at, I don't earn enough to invest, um, people not diversifying, bad strategies, trying to time the markets, not making the most of KiwiSaver, and I bet there's nobody in this room who's actually doing KiwiSaver optimally. People don't think they are, but most people are not doing it quite as well as they could. First of all, some people aren't even in it. Is anyone not in it who would like to explain why. I mean, sometimes I get someone raising a hand, it's because they're not a New Zealand resident, and that's a good reason. But apart from that, there aren't really any very good reasons anymore. Um, over 65, you're allowed to join now, so and it's a real pity not to be in there. I'm going to look very briefly at Bitcoin, um, and when people get in the way, and a quick look at the book. So don't earn enough to invest. Just looking at this briefly. There's a woman in the book who um, a single woman age 66 who works for $21 an hour and she said she wrote to me and said she paid $290,000 for a cottage and renovated it and she's paying off $214,000 mortgage and she saves $100 a fortnight. And when I look at that I think people who say they haven't got enough income or wherewithal to save, people can if they really want to. I mean Look, there are people in New Zealand, there are families that are really, really struggling to, to feed their children, and so I'm not dissing them. It's just that there's a heck of a lot of people who say they can't afford to save or invest to actually, and they make it a priority. Um, not diversifying, okay, so this is basic bread and butter stuff, but a lot of people don't get it quite right. So, higher returns come with higher risk. So we've, we've got here the, um, 2%, if you 
are um, investing and earning 2%, which you might these days in the bank term deposit. After, after 40 years, you've got, looks like about $7,000, whereas if you're earning 8%, which would be very lucky to earn actually in anything on a consistent basis, even houses and shares, that's a bit high. But sometimes you do for, for brief periods, and look how much more. The growth especially, you see the difference in the reds, the, the five years isn't, isn't huge, but by the time you get to the blue bands over 40 years, it's huge if you invest in riskier assets you are going to get higher returns and you're going to get a lot more at the end. So here's um, a graph that I had to just get updated recently because look what's happened to <coughs> New Zealand shares and world shares have dipped down too. They're in there behind the other one. Um, but the clear message, so you've got your New Zealand shares in green and, and um, New Zealand commercial property in, in the mustard colour and overseas shares in red. You can see how up and down they go. This is the 87 share market crash, which some of you might remember, I certainly do, where the shares halved. It doesn't look like a big flip there, but value of shares halved. And then here's the, the overseas, the um, uh, tech boom and bubble. Here's the global financial crisis, both. So there's some huge downs, but look at the growth overall. This is $1,000 invested in 1973. In New Zealand shares, 1,000 has grown to 120,000 after tax. It's extraordinary. So you can see clearly from looking at that graph that if you go into the riskier investments, there's going to be some big downs, but the trend is always upwards. And in the end, you have a heck of a lot more money than you do in bonds, which have their little ups and downs, and they've had downs recently too because interest rates have risen. Um, won't go into that in detail, but here. But um, the, you can see clearly the rockier the ride, the more growth you get in the long term. By the way, please interrupt me if you've got a question or a comment. If you disagree with what I'm saying, that's always really interesting. I learn from people saying, no, that's not what happened to me, or I'm sure that's not right. Um, and you, you might be right. We can have a chat about it. So please interrupt. Um, as we go, just raise your hands. But which will perform best this year out of shares, um, property, etc.? Now, this is a very impressive graph that I've like, tabled, and, and I won't go into it in any detail, but each colour, like the, the sort of purpley colour up there, is global equity, global shares. And you can see how in 2012, they were, so it was global listed property came top and then New Zealand shares and then global shares. So 2012 New Zealand did very well. Listed down there of how well they did. But then you, if you look, just step back and look at it, you can see how each type of asset does well sometimes in some years and, and not so well in other years. And it's, it's just a big mess. It looks quite pretty from the colours. But, but the, um, when you look at any type of asset, that you're going to be investing in. It has its up years and its down years. And they, the, the, that's a Mercer table and you can pull out, you can see that New Zealand cash is up and down, world shares, New Zealand property. New Zealand shares, they're all going up and down over the years in terms of their performance relative to other assets. So what you do about it, you invest in, in a wide range of different types of assets. It's, it's um, foolish to go with any particular type of, like New Zealand shares uh, have done better than world shares in recent times, but they haven't always and they won't always. And so you're better to get into all the shares around the world. Go into a, a fund that holds the whole lot is by far the easiest way to do that. And then you also want to have some money in property. Now it might only be your own home. A lot of people say that's plenty to have in property, but other people say, no, we quite like to have rental property as well, which of course is a hard one because you need quite a lot, of, a lot more money to, to expand into a whole other house. But there are other ways of getting into property. You can go into funds that hold a whole lot of different commercial properties. And you want some bonds, you want different types of assets going through because some will do well one year and some will do well another year and you want to try and smooth out the path. Um, 
You also want to diversify within each type of asset. So then I mean I own lots of bonds, lots of shares, lots of properties, lots of balloons. This woman I snapped in Vietnam, she's got lots of balloons and that lowers her risk because there's sure to be any child that she spots is sure to like at least one of them. It's really a good idea to own lots of different ones, and for most of us that means going into a fund, it means going into a KiwiSaver or other fund to get that nice widespread. That's what I've done my whole adult life, is just invest in funds. I, I do own Mercury Energy shares because um, they were, when the government was, was selling them to the public a while back, I wanted to see what sort of communications they gave to ordinary New Zealanders, so I, Bought the minimum amount just to watch what's happened through there, but that's the only individual she's home. Um, yeah, better to just get into the funds and make life easy. So some stories from the book. Um, this one is uh, a mother, who, a woman who wrote about her mother who had invested in a single share in a single company in 1980. And, and the woman wrote it was a scheme by her employer where employees were offered an interest-free loan to buy shares. Mum is dead now, but she believed she was doing the right thing and helping us for the future. So the mother had thought she was investing and in getting, getting a great legacy for her children. And she put in 21 and 50, and it was now worth less than that in 2020. Um, I responded to that letter by saying, that's really sad, because if she'd put her 2000, you saw that graph before, that could have grown to, I don't know, 50, 100 maybe by now. Um, if it had been in a wide range, but it was just in the one share, the company share. So I said to her, um, why don't you just blow the 2000 on a big dinner for your family? <laughs> and she wrote back the next week, I felt you really understood mum, and I'm deeply grateful for that. And yes, we're going to go out together for my brother's 70th and raise a glass to our wonderful mum. Which always makes me feel a bit moved when I read it. Um, so that's an example of the stories in the book where the, the lesson is, not a good idea to invest in a single share, but the reason I like that book is because it's in the context of a, of a nice story of real people and how these things happen. And here's another example of picking a single share. A guy wrote to me and said, I'm up about 250% on what I paid for Auckland Airport. And that was February 2020, and then look what happened right after that, the share price plunged and, and who would have thought it? If you go back to before COVID was even whispered, so let's say late 2019, Auckland Airport, just masses of people, more and more people going through all the time, everyone would think that's a rock solid investment, how could that one go wrong? It's just an example of the kind of thing that can happen if you invest in a single company. Nobody, nobody can predict what's going to go on. Um, so, the NZX50, which is the index of the biggest 50 shares in New Zealand, somebody did some research a while back on the 10 years to April 2019, and the average return of the index was 16% a year, which is very impressive. That, as it happened, was before the, the recent 2020 crash, not crash, but big sudden COVID-related downturn, and then the current downturn, where we don't know quite how long that's going to last. But before that, there were 10 years with an average return of 16%, which is astonishing. Um, how many of the 50 shares beat the index? So we've got the index, which represents all the 50 shares, and how many had negative returns, and how many had lower volatility than the index? Now, I don't expect you to know these. So, um, of the 50 sh shares, only 13 did better than the index. So nearly all the shares did worse than the index. The, those 13, of course, did very much better than the index, otherwise it wouldn't work out. The averaging wouldn't work out. But the point is that when trying to pick which ones are going to do better than the index, it's just sheer luck, honestly. Um, people think they're good at picking them. But um, how many had negative returns? Seven. In a period where the average return for the 50 was 16%. Seven of, seven of them had negative average returns. So they, you know, imagine if you picked one of those companies, and only one had lower volatility than the index, which is really interesting when you look at it on a graph. So when you invest in a, in a fund, 
with a whole lot of different shares in it, the volatility is a lot less, of course, because when one share is going down, another one's going up, and they and they calm one another down. Um, so it, it is often said that diversification by owning a lot of different shares is a free lunch. That that saying there's no such thing as a free lunch, which Milton Friedman supposedly said, American economist. Um, this is a free lunch in that you can get the same average return by being in a fund that owns a whole lot of shares, but less volatility. And that's a, a trade-off that normally you can't get. So um, I recommend investing in, in funds that hold a lot of shares, um, or, or 50 shares in index funds is a great way to invest. At, at the end of the talk, if you want to, we can talk a bit more about index funds. Um, they're a bit of a thing of mine, as some of you will know. Uh, but moving on now to some bad strategies, panicking. Um, I got a letter from a 21-year-old who said that her mother moved to a lower-risk Kiwi Saver fund in the COVID plunge. I told her, listen to Mary before you do anything, but she didn't. Now that I have shown her all of your warnings after months of tirelessly suggesting your podcast, it is too late the damage has been done. So I said, tell her to move back fast because this was quite early in that plunge and I thought it might go down more and she's made a really bad, bad move <coughs> and learn from this. Um, and, and, and one of the things to learn is that perhaps you can't cope with the volatility you thought you could cope with. A lot of New Zealanders have found that in KiwiSaver and other funds where the markets just kept going up and up for 10 years, pretty much, from the global financial crisis through to, to 2020. Um, and people were taking, you know, in the higher risk funds, and then when the markets plunged, they couldn't cope, and that's awful. You really must spend, because then, because then if you feel you're going to move down to lower risk when the markets have gone down, that's when you make your losses real. If you don't do that, if you, at the moment, a lot of people are sitting on and really unhappy. I've had so many letters. I've lost, people say, $20,000 or whatever in my in my shares or in, in my Kiwi Saver fund. They haven't lost it. It's just that it's gone down. Um, it's just like owning a house. At the moment, house prices have gone down. We don't walk around saying, I've lost $50,000 or $100,000 in a house, even though the value of it might have gone down 100000 by now. They're going, they're going down. Um, and, and as long as you keep hold of the, the shares, the same as the house, I'll come back up again. Um, but if you realise you can't cope, when you look at, when you see these, these downturns and you can't cope, then gradually reduce your risk. Get, get down there because you don't want to be panicking, it's not healthy. Rather than do that though, it would be much better to try and get more courage to stay in the higher risk. Um, <coughs> Another young man wrote to me and said, please <coughs> convince my father because I have written that frequent trading is not a smart thing. Usually it's shares, but it can be bonds or other, or other things where people are in and out of the markets picking when they're going to buy these certain shares and when they're going to sell them and what's going to happen to the markets. And um, so I just quoted one piece of research. There's lots of research on this, but um, for that, for that, done from 89 to 2019, so we've got 30 years there. Uh, <clears throat> the share market index rose nearly 10% a year, but the average index has got 5% a year um, because they were going in and out of the markets. <coughs> and um, it's really people that think, ah, but I'm smarter than the average person, I can do it. But usually you can't. Do it for a while, and then, and then. Do well for a while and then, then you don't. Over oh, this is just to show the difference between those over 30 years, 10,000 at 5% becomes 45,000 at 10% it becomes nearly 200,000. I mean, that difference is very powerful over a long time. So it, it's interesting. The, the, the gender research shows very strongly that women tend to be too conservative, they don't take enough risk at two scared of taking risk. The men trade too often. And <laughs> they, they, they both think they're not, not <laughs> ideal behaviour. Um, not always. And, you know, sometimes I get people coming up to me afterwards and saying, hey, I'm a woman and I trade all the time, or, or whatever. Um, 
the researchers see their research consistently shows that the average investor has a strong tendency to sell at just the wrong time whenever there's a lot of market volatility. It's, it's a sad thing. The smarter ones buy rather than sell when the markets are going down. Um, but even then, it's not wise. So we're trying to time the markets. We have a look at this. Um, should you stop contributions in a downturn? And that's one thing I'm getting in letters. People are saying, all right, I won't move in my Kiwi saver to another fund, but I, they say, I'm sick of my contributions going nowhere. They see the contributions going in, and yet this Kiwi saver balance keeps going down, and they, it feels like the money you're putting in is going down the drain. But in fact, what, what's actually happening is you're buying units in the fund that are cheaper at the moment. Um, it's fantastic, you're buying bargains. Um, you get more units when the market's down, less when they're up. So you end up with more cheap units than expensive ones if you keep putting your money in. And most people in KiwiSaver, if you're an employee, the money is just regularly going in anyway. If you've stopped your contributions, please start again. There's a heap of a lot of people in KiwiSaver who gone on what used to be called contributions holidays and are now called saving suspensions because the government realised that contribution holiday sounded too nice and they <laughs> discouraged it. But um, keep putting that money in, keep just chipping it in and in the long run you're going to end up with more cheap units than expensive ones which is, which is how you actually win. Regular savings are easy too, you can just set it and forget it. So those of you who are in Kiwi saver, but you're not an employee. You might be self-employed, you might be retired, you might be at home looking after children for all sorts of other reasons. It's really a good idea, obviously, to get your 1,042 in there a year to get the maximum from the government. But a good way to do that is to set up an automatic transfer of $87 a month, or you could do 20 a week, either way. And then set up an automatic transfer out of your bank account and that way you get this, you're buying the cheaper units more when they're cheap and fewer when they're expensive. You get that same advantage. A steady, steady investment with the same amount works really well for everybody. Um, should I stop contributing in a downturn? So I went and looked a while back at, because I, I thought, gosh, quite often there's a really good year after a downturn. So these are all the years that um, the New Zealand share market's basically gone down the NZD 50, has had a loss on, in a calendar year. And you can see the first one was the 87 crash, big crash there, and the year after that, the market gained only 1%, but the year after that, it gained 16. That was a heck of a crash, um, as the older people here will, will remember. Part of the trouble was people had borrowed to invest in shares in New Zealand at that point, and that's why it was so ghastly and why it was so hard to get back out of, because that's risky stuff. If you put your own savings in the shares is one thing, but if you're borrowing to invest, and then the shares become worthless, and you've still got a debt, that leads to people. I might just add, that's when um, my husband and I lost 30% on a house, right after the share market crash, the the house market also crashed in places like we were living in St. Helias then, and those sort of more expensive suburbs where a lot of people had borrowed a lot of money to invest in shares and the market crashed, and they all had to sell their houses. And, and we, had, we didn't have to sell it. We bought elsewhere in Auckland. We thought we were buying and selling in the same market, but it wasn't the same market. It was awful. Um, anyway, these things can happen in property as well. Um, but if you have a look through at the other lost years and you look at the gains the following years, those gains, 34% is a fantastic contribution in, in the market in, in a year. And the others, a couple of 20s at 27. Um, last year there was a tiny little drop in, in 2021. The market went up and then down at the end. This year, who knows? I mean, it might, this might be another, another time where it takes a couple of years to recover, but it might not. The market, the last day or two, I, how is it today? Does anyone know? I haven't seen today. It, the, the yesterday, it was, it was turning around again. And it, look at CAN, and people just automatically start thinking, it's going to keep going down. Because the economy is forecast to not be good, but that doesn't mean the share market will keep going down, because we all already know the economy, the economic forecast is not good, 
And that, so that's already meant people have sold their shares and that won't necessarily, the market, share market doesn't necessarily keep going down because the economy gets a bit dirty for a while. So just think about that. Whenever there's an, a down year, there's a really good chance the following year will be good and quite possibly very good. And you'd be really annoyed if you were out of the market and missing out on a 34% gain. Mm -hmm. it's, um, just hang in there, everybody. So I think I was just looking at this, the NZX50 so far this year. This, I had, had to send the slides into Kylie a few days ago. <laughs> there would have been a nice little uptick at the end of, of that red one. Um, but that, to put it in perspective, see this year, the market has, has been gloomy. But look at, look at what's happened from 2003. It's this long-term gain, and it'll come back again. It, it always, well, it's, um, you're welcome to take photos. I don't mind that, but just by the way, that it's, on, it's online. It's, it's easy to get, it's just to NZX50 chart, and up they come for the day and the year. And, and, um, but you don't necessarily want to follow it too closely. Um, should I contribute more in a downturn? So this is contrarian investing, and I wouldn't, wouldn't mind betting there's some of you people who do a bit of that, who um, do the opposite to what most people are doing. And it's actually, it's certainly a lot better than following the crowd, than selling when the markets are going down. These are people who are saying, I'm going to get in there and buy. We've got um, Lord Rothschild there, when there's blood on the street, I am buying. He, and he made, <coughs> made you know, a hugely wealthy man from doing that. Um, but do remember we only hear the good stories. People, it's really, there's real biases out there in investing, aren't there? But people tell you, they love to tell you about their houses. How the, someone was telling me today, her, the, the, her house she bought in, in Mount Eden for a uh, hundred and something thousand, quite a long time ago. It's a big piece of land and it's worth 10 million. And you know, you hear these stories all the time. But, um, we don't hear the ones that, that, except I just told you I had a house that dropped 30%, but most people don't, don't tell you these things. So be a bit wary about the stories you hear. Not making the most of Kiwis, and please interrupt, by the way, please. I hate it when there's no questions or comments. <laughs> you might be falling asleep. Um, <laughs> um, a man wrote in and said that he's got half a million dollars and his partner's got nothing. Um, and he's trying to persuade her to, to join, and she isn't working at the moment, but she contributes 1042 a year, and she goes into a medium risk fund, and so the return might be about 3% after fees and tax. So just putting that amount in, after 10 years in KiwiSaver, she'd have about 18,000, whereas out of KiwiSaver, she'd have about 12. And that's just because she's not getting the government contribution outside KiwiSaver. It's multiplying her money by one and a half. So that's just multiplying those numbers by one and a half. And after 30 years, it's 75 odd versus 50 odd. Um, and if it was a higher risk, I'm making 10, um, 6% a year. We've got, when you look down over 30 years, we've got 128 versus 85. Um, big, big differences from not being, and it's a real pity that any New Zealander, especially between 18 and 65, not to be in there getting that money from the government. You put the money in there, it's taxpayer money that went in. Get your share back out again. Um, I actually highly recommend KiwiSaver for people in retirement as well, but, or people over 65, but um, they don't get the government money anymore. It's all the more reason to get in while you can get it. Um, and just by the way, I want to just note in, the difference between a medium risk fund and a, and a, and a high risk fund, <coughs> the different sort of amounts. So we've got about, after 30 years, in, in KiwiSaver, we've got 75.9 versus um, 128. So, so that's the comparable numbers, but with a higher risk, how much difference over the long term it makes being in higher risk. So there's a couple of different messages here. There's KiwiSaver versus not KiwiSaver. And then there's, if you can bear to take the high risk and take the, the lumps with, with the ups and downs over the long term, you're pretty much guaranteed to end up with more. Um, so which KiwiSaver fund 
And this is where, as I was saying before, probably not many people are in the very best key state of funds for them. Now, this, I do hold seminars on this, but we'll just go over the very key points here. The Kiwi Saver Fund Finder, which is on the sorted website, um, you can find the right Kiwi Saver Fund for you, and they, they ask you three questions. I want to use my Kiwi Saver money in, and you can fill out your options for how, how many years before you're planning to, use, to spend the money. And over a given year, I'm comfortable with this possible gain or loss, so that's gauging your attitude to volatility. And then the final one is it's important to get back at least as much as I put in versus it's um, I <coughs> will accept likely higher returns over the long term even if it means bigger ups and downs. So you can read those things and just click on those three answers and then it will tell you what level of Kiwi Saver Fund is right for you. So it's basically about how long it is before you spend the money and how much you can tolerate volatility going through. Um, quick easy way to do it. Which KiwiSaver fund? So this is some, um, this is this, you know, this is where a lot of people I don't think do as well as they could. Do you go with highest returns? Do you go with lowest fees? Do you go with which everyone advertises itself best? Most people, if they don't think about it much, go with the one with the highest returns. Why wouldn't you? Uh, well, there's some very good reasons why you wouldn't. I mean, in, in a nutshell, it's because the one with the highest returns won't necessarily continue to have high returns and in fact there's quite a lot of research to suggest the ones with highest returns are quite often also the ones with lowest returns because they might be taking more risk or they might and also even if there was someone who was really brilliant at choosing which shares to invest in we don't know when they get hired away by another Kiwi Saver provider do we? We we're, um, There's all sorts of shuffling that goes on in there and um, so I hope I can convince you with the next few slides um, Morningstar, which, which looks at KiwiSaver data every quarter, so this is just from the last, the last results. And I always look at their results when they come out and there's always something similar to this. So looking at the funds with 10 year information, because a lot of them are newer than 10 years, so if you look at the Morningstar results, um, there's a lot of funds that have only been around for 5 years, 3 years, whatever. I only, for this I only look at one for the long term results because I want to compare the long with the short. So there are nine conservative funds that have got 10 year information. And the one that performed best in the three months was, was actually second to last over 10 years. And the one that was second in three months was fifth, which is still not awfully good out of nine over 10 years. Um, you see that the ones that do well on a short period or a long period don't necessarily the other way around. Five aggressive funds, so they're the highest risk ones. We've got the best in three months was second to last over 10 years, and the second in three months was last over 10 years. Um, it doesn't always happen like that. I'm picking out the ones that are examples of this, but don't ever, some of you will be in some of the KiwiSaver providers that pride themselves on keeping on getting high returns, and some of them have had a good record. But if you look, there's a lot of research done in particular in America, but, but everywhere, where you look at over decades, and we haven't had decades in KiwiSaver yet, but some interesting American research on the last 10 years versus the 10 years before that, and the ones that did really well in the 10 years before that, look at them through to the more recent 10 years, <coughs> and they were on average three quarters of the way down, and none of them had done very well. I mean, it just keeps on happening. What did well before? Um, won't necessarily do well again, and in fact, is somewhat more likely to do quite badly. Um, these are, once again, I look at these all on a regular basis on the Financial Markets Authority um, KiwiSaver Tracker, which is on the FMA website. They look at, this is some of the data that comes out of it. Now this is defensive funds, so we've got returns going up the side, and we've got fees coming across the bottom. So if the ones with low fees did badly and the ones with high fees did well, you would expect to have a line, the, 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 the um, <coughs> circles going like that, going up from here, up like that. But in fact, you've got a mess there, really. 
I mean the one with the very highest returns is, is a sort of middle fee one up there and, and, and then the others are all over the place and if you look at um, balance fund, same thing, just a big mess, the one with the Sure, this one's this one who did that did very well. It's got quite high fees, but the highest fee one of all, the worst of all. I mean, it's just. And, and then we, if we look at growth funds, it's the same thing. Another big mess. The highest performer of all up here is just an average sort of fee one. Um, if you look at that gra those graphs, you can see there is not any correlation between fees and performance. You're not seeing that you get more for paying more. It's not like in, in most things you get more if you pay more. I mean, not absolutely, we know that, but you, you tend to get probably a better car if you pay more for it or, or whatever. It doesn't work in KiwiSaver. So any questions or comments about that? People can challenge these things, but every Quarter, I think the, key, the FMA puts this on their website and you can go and look through the graphs and you can say, yeah. Sometimes one of the graphs, you say, oh, there seems to be a bit of a trend that way and then another one seems to be a trend the opposite way. So you can't say you look at that and see that um, high returns come only with high fees. Yeah. I have a question about what you consider, I mean, is a, a reasonable fee to pay? What would you consider? Um, I mean, um, point two is it, a lot. Yeah, it's point two is great. Yeah, I'll actually let me just hold that question to a couple more slides because okay. yeah, it's good. It's a good question. Um, go for low fees is what I say. People don't look at the returns. By all means, look through the returns on on this is this is on sorted um, Kiwi Saver Fund Finder, and they all sorted has also got the Smart Investor tool. Both of those will give you this sort of information. By all means, don't go to a fund that's had consistently bad returns. Who'd want to do that? But beyond that, don't look at returns because they honestly can go badly later. So this tool, you can... Oh, the question, yes. Um, how often do you recommend switching to the new investment? How often did you say? Yeah. Recommending providers or... Yeah. Um, once. The, after tonight, go on this tool, find a lot of you, and, and just stick with it, for the most part. Yeah, unless, unless there's something you particularly dislike about. If you wanted to get more into ethical investing, go to Mindful Money website. I don't know if some of you will know that. that that's got all the information. So there are, there are sometimes reasons like that, but generally, no. Don't start moving around because you think it's performed badly, for example, because, as I say, next year it might be the top performer. The, um, and, and looking at the fee levels, you were asking about fees. Um, now, this doesn't show the percentage fees. This is, this is total fees for retirement by your age and balance. This is just a sample that I came up with. Um, I thought it did show percentage fees. It doesn't. They tend to be a bit higher for the higher risk funds. They say they cost a bit more to run them. but. You want to try and get under 0.5 percent if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and, and preferably lower than that. Yeah, yeah. that is simplicity. Simplicity and and super life and in, invest now, which is showing on here. Yeah. And um, the BNZ has dropped its fees a whole lot, and so they're actually surprisingly um, not too bad on the fees now. So you don't necessarily want to go for the lowest one, but because you can have a look on Smart Investor and see what type of investments they've got, but learn a little bit about the kind of investment philosophy, and it might be ethical, etc. There's other factors in there, but I really, really recommend going with one of the low fee ones. And one warning about that is that they, most of the low fee ones are index funds. They invest in all the shares in the market index. Um, they're all they're something called passive rather than active, they're cheaper to run, so they're lower fees. They are not going to be top performers either, because they're just they're investing in the average, they're investing in the index. They, they don't ever star, and they don't ever go down the bottom either. And so if you're looking at star performers, they're not going to be there, but, but they, they steadily go along with the lower fees, 
and in the long run. I've been investing in um, index funds since the 1970s when I was in America doing an MBA and um, learned about them. They were very new then, they were brand new, radical idea. And, and I put money in them in and I've never taken it out. And it's done very nicely. So um, we never know who's going to be the star performers, do we? Is that the point? We don't know who would be the star performers? Well, you don't know who's going to be in the future. Yeah. You can look at the, you can the, look past. At, um, the past ones on, yeah. on Morningstar, etc. Yeah. Um, but exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We don't know. No. But it won't ever be an index fund because they chug along in the middle of that average. Yeah. They're boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So, Barry, to that point, taking out of Kiwi Savings, if you were to put your money, your $100 a month, <coughs> would you put it into an index, direct it into an index, say 15 index, <coughs> or a managed fund? Now, they're the same thing. A managed fund is a term that I use broadly for the whole lot of any funds, basically. So are you thinking of... So I'm thinking, say you've got your $100 a month that you're yes. investing, do you put it directly into an NZX 50? Yes. Or do you put it in, say, a simplicity growth fund where it's got European funds, Australian funds? Yeah, the, the, if you go into, into one of the, you know, say, simplicity, um, you will get a wider range of countries, and, and that's a good idea. It's a really good idea. Um, I don't know whether I've got a table on that, but if you look at different countries, what's done, with, you know, they're all over, it's like they've got the picture made of all the different colours. Um, so, yes. But they would charge more fees generally than straight into a simple index fund? Not, not necessarily. I mean, have a look around. I'm not sure of all the fees that everybody's charging. You can get them to, you know, some of them quite cheaply on the platforms, on chairsies or in. Invest now is another one that's not as well known, and they've got low fees and all that. So have a look around. Go for the low fees, but get yes, get a why an international. There are international index funds. Um, SmartShares has got some. SmartShares has got a very very wide range of of that's run by it's owned by the stock exchange, and it's got a very wide range of index funds. And um, almost too many you get overwhelmed when you look at them. But they've got some international ones. I'm pretty sure, and that would be a good. A good one. Yeah, yeah. Um, was there any any other questions? Yes. Um, so I guess in terms of the the fees, um, how do you balance that against the diversity in the you touched on a bit there, but something like simplicity is very heavy in New Zealand. Um, you, yes. The simplicity. I don't know. In the growth funds, they have international shares too. They have over three thousand spread across the world in that growth fund. Do they? Yeah, yes. They do. Yeah. yeah. Have a look. On Smart Investor, which is on the sort of website, there's a lot of really good information about all the key saver funds. You can break it gives you a breakdown of of you know New Zealand versus international shares and that sort of thing. But it also gives you the biggest ten investments they're in and there's a whole lot of stuff on there that you can explore. What what the funds are in. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, say you like you are super set to change and you want to change your funds. Yes. How would you recommend going about it? Do you just bite the bullet and move all the money at once to some fund? So um, yeah. If change? you're moving within the same provider you to change. Yeah, say for example you decide you want to buy a house or you yes. want to Yes. Um, now, by the way, simplicity is the only provider I think that won't let you be in more than one of funds. Um, most providers will, and I talked to Sam about that, and he said we're trying to keep it cheap, <laughs> but um, I, I think you might have to change that because as you're getting nearer to buying a house or taking, don't forget it's not really just retiring because when you retire you typically don't spend all the money at once, although you might pay off a mortgage, but unless you're doing that, you want to keep keep some of your short-term, medium-term and long-term money through until you're 90, actually. You want to keep keep that range going. But um, it's not a bad idea to move things fairly gradually, oh, but on the other hand, you can muck around forever. I mean, I'd say sometimes, maybe take a third of it and move it now, and a third in a month, and a third in two months, or something like that. Don't, because you've you made up your mind, let's get on with it. It's just that if you move the whole lot on one day, um, sometimes you can really regret it because uh, that turns out to be, you know, 
bottom of the market, the market just turns around just right after that. So there's sort of psychological path to it too that makes it, and quite a lot of people won't make a move they think they should make like that because they're going to buy a house or some, it's nothing to do with the markets. They want to move their money for a personal reason and they oh, don't want to do it right now because it might end up being the wrong time to do it and so they don't do it. And it's better to just divide it into three or four lots and then it's psychologically easier to do. Um, yes? What about managed fund index versus uh, buying ETFs directly? Yeah, it's, it's the same thing, really. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, if you can buy from three, you tend to be lower fees, probably. So, yeah. I do include ETFs and managed funds in my head. I don't know whether everybody, there's right. definitions out there, you know, but they are basically the same. I'd better push on. We can take more questions. Or one more, and then, yeah. I was just going to make a few comments, Mary. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, love the column. Thank you very much. Um, the other thing I was going to say was that we probably owe Sir Michael Cullen a debt of gratitude will ever repay. Mm. The way parliamentarians have mucked around with super over the years, we did yes. nothing to give all. And Cullen took the bull by the horns. The other thing I was going to say was about banks. I had quite a deep complaint about a certain bank, uh, BNZ Resolve. I took it through them. They said to me, oh, we closed your complaint because we're getting some to renew on Monday. I said, well, no way about it. The complaints would have been ran open until we get a resolution. And I thought that was pretty underhanded. And I took it to the ombudsman and, um, and they that stuff. But you do yeah. have to watch the language. Oops. And the other last thing I was going to say, I had someone, a friend of mine, lost quite a bit of money on those finance companies who went under a few right. years ago. And reading the book I, about it, I believe there was a motion moved in AG and someone got up and said, I move that no auditor be appointed to save the company money. And that caused oh, a disaster. It's so not, that's not legal. Interesting, <laughs> interesting comment. Yeah, yeah. Interesting comment. Let me uh, push on. Um, we can take some more questions at the end, but better keep moving here. Um, a man complained to Kiwi Saver, his provider, the cost of return was minus five for the year. Each month he had, the provider asked him, the provider told me about this. Each month he had moved to the best performing fund in the previous month with, within that provider. He had been 11 times. If he stayed in his original fund, he would have made nine points. Shocking story of somebody moving around to the last, last month's best performer. Yeah. Um, the only good reason for switching fund type <coughs> are you're getting close to spending the money either on the house or, or in retirement, typically. You can't have volatility. In which case, if you move, stay move, don't, when the markets start going again, say, oh, oh gosh, I wish I'd been back at higher risk, but I'm going to go back up to it, and then go back now. Those people that do that, move that 10% versus 5%, it's that kind of difference that happens. Nothing to do with what's happening in the markets, just ignore them. It's, um, I think Warren Buffett said some time now ago that he just thought, he, he, he thought we should buy Share certificates back when there were such things. Put them in the bottom drawer and look at them in every five years, perhaps. Um, don't look. Okay, Bitcoin, just briefly. Um, uh, do you understand it? Well, I sort of do. I've read a lot about it. There's been some less of us in the column lately that some of you will have seen. Um, and obviously, it's fine if you're playing with it and you want to put a couple of percent cents of your money in there for, you know, $1,000 just just for a bit of a laugh. The trouble is, if you do really well with that thousand dollars, and some people will, if, you know, because you do, if you just catch the market when it's, when it's doing the right thing, um, then they, that's when people start saying, oh, put a thousand dollars in and it's now, I had a woman in the, in the paper last Saturday who um, some of her money has been multiplied by 10 that, that she's put in there. And at one point it was multiplied by 30, but of course she didn't realize it was coming down. But it's now it's multiplied by 10, which is still fantastic. Awfully easy for her to start saying, oh, oh I think I might move half my total savings into that. Um, not a very good idea, just, just too risky. Look, at, look how often it's halving going through there. It's um, not just in recent times, but there's this half there, and gone on down to the worse than half, and then nearly half there, and it's half there. It's just, um, it's compared with shares, it's very volatile. Is it a good hedge, which means 
some people buy gold for this reason. They say gold tends to go up when shares go down, and down when shares go up. And by the way, with gold, to some extent that's true, although certainly not always. Um, and some people have said that with Bitcoin, but it's, it's actually the opposite. The, a crypto fund manager said recently, he expects the price to, to worse than halve at least once in every two years, whereas American shares, because that was the data I could get, drops more than 30% once in every 10 years. So it's less of a drop with the shares, 30% drop versus 50% drop on Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's doing it once in every two years, and the American market's doing it once in every 10 years. It's much more volatile than shares, in other words. And it's not a particularly good hedge either. The, um, one of the crypto fund managers that was interviewed in the Herald said, oh, we've tended to tended to go up when the shares have gone up and tended to go down when the shares have gone down. So so it's not, um, I don't think it's a great idea to, to have, have money in Bitcoin, but certainly not a lot of your money unless you're really young and really into taking a lot of risk. It's only a currency, see, it's not actually representing, um, it's not like shares where you're owning shares in a company that's usually growing by selling and making making profits, or in property where you've got this property there that's a real thing that's providing services, accommodating family or a business. Um, it could put that just a currency. It's like investing in the New Zealand dollar or the American dollar, which is what they call a zero sum game. That if one person makes a dollar, another person loses a dollar in, in currency, whereas in shares everybody's money over the long haul is growing in currency, it's not. And crypto is similar, and in fact I was Googling is crypto a zero sum game and up came several answers that said it's worse than a zero sum game, so more money lost than gained in it, so yeah. Um, when people get in the way, finally just a couple of quick, because, because and this is what my red book is partly, one of the points of it is that it's not all about optimizing things financially, there's other stuff that happens. So an example, um, the wife wants to stick with property and the man writes to me and says we've got $200,000 a year, 200000 in Kiwi savings, two, two, so we've got four rentals and a mortgage-free home and retirement home. And the obvious response to that is, yeah, get out of property, diversify. But then I thought about it and I thought, no, here's a married couple. She wants to stay with property. They are so well off, it doesn't matter. <laughs> stay in property if she wants to stay in property and keep the marriage together. Um, so <laughs> that's the point. So it isn't all, always about, about money. Um, some unusual retirements. Retiring at 45. Who's heard of the FIRE movement? Did some of you want to do the yeah, financial independence retire early? Started in, I think, Canada and it's quite big around the world, and people who save like half their income. They live very poor, you know, on very low incomes, they grow their own veggies and they don't go out much and all of that. So they can retire at 45 or, or younger sometimes. Um, and look, that's up to them. I personally wouldn't want to, but retire at that age. And I think probably a lot of them would then turn around and get another job, but they can always get another job and give the money to charity. Whatever. It's just an interesting, the, and this, I write about it in the book because it's an interesting thing to ponder and a, an interesting challenge for people who say they have trouble cutting back their spending. I sometimes say to them, go and look on the fire pages and see how people really do do that. A couple of letters from people who are living in caravans and now they're not people who are too poor to own a house. They've chosen to live in caravans and not necessarily camper vans. At least one of them, they were just sort of said, oh, this is uncomplicated life and I like being able to move around. It's just, they're just interesting ideas to read about and think about other things you can do if you like. Um, retired couple considering selling their home and renting, which is a really interesting one. And um, most of you live in Auckland, you're here now, and so and those of you who own a home, don't, you know, they're all worth just ridiculous amounts of money at the moment. And, um, you know, we could, a lot of us could sell our house and then have a very nice retirement with a heck of a lot of travel and everything else. Um, so it's something worth considering. The, the hard part, of course, is that you need to be sure you're covering rent until you die, and you really want a longer-term lease 
most retired people, that would be big negative for a lot of people as they get older, they don't want to feel like they could be churched up. But it's just an interesting, turns upside down most New Zealanders thinking. A now wealthy woman reluctant to spend, um, she, uh, in the end, I, um, I, and, and this is not at all uncommon, in fact I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were some people in this room like that who got so used to being frugal when they were younger they can't get out of the habit. Um, she, I was suggested, among other things, to spend on others because the longer you live, the more you realise that you actually get more pleasure out of giving than receiving. You really do. It's not just that it sounds nice. Um, it, it, if you give something and, and the person really receive, really loves it, really appreciates it, you get a lot of joy out of that. But I just wanted, yes. Are, are such people, you know, the people that hold on to their money, regardless, are they good for the economy or not? Well, if, if it's invested, it's all right. You know, it's in it's in shares and, and bonds and so on, so they're not necessarily bad. Spending isn't necessarily good for the economy, I don't, I don't say. But I just, just want to tell you quickly about another man. After I wrote the book, another man wrote in, who, who'd read this in the book, and he said, oh, look, I'm, I'm in my 80s and I'm a multi-millionaire, and I don't have much trouble spending on, on vehicles and travel and that, but the little things, like he said, I go to the supermarket and I can't stop buying the cheapest beer, even though I hate it. <laughs> and he said, he said um, the other day my wife said, let's go out for dinner, darling, and he said, thought about it for a while, and he said, all right, I'll take you to the RSA. <laughs> but only if we have a couple of drinks at home first, because they charge too much for a glass of wine. <laughs> so off they went to the RSA, and at the end of dinner, she said, oh, I won't like some dessert. And he said, how much is it? And she said, $10. And he said, you can pay for yourself. <laughs> he reported all this to me. And I put his letter in the paper and um, said, oh, you know, come on. OK, you've, you've got to go to the supermarket and buy the most expensive beer. And you've got to treat your wife better. But anyway, the, the funniest part was that, that the following week, he wrote me a letter and said, my wife was reading the paper last Saturday. And she looked up and she said, Oh, darling, there's someone else like you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said, we had, a, I confess, we had a good laugh, and then, and then um, we drank a bottle of bubbles, and he said, mind you, it was a bottle her children had given her on Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> there's no hope for some people. <laughs> there are there, yeah. Um, so sometimes, sometimes I think people should do what they want to do. You know, there are these sort of rules that we've talked about, but um, I think some people get too worried about doing the right thing, like there was a solo mum who really, she wanted to buy a new kitchen, but she thought she should be saving to support her daughter at university. And, and reading between the lines in that letter, it seemed to me like she probably struggled a lot, and that the daughter could get, um, she can get a student loan. You know, in the, in the long, the, the data shows that people who go to university and run up student loans, they, on average, make enough more money for having gone to university to well and truly cover the student loan. Not every case, but usually. I said, get yourself in your kitchen. Um, but sometimes, sometimes for some people that really matters. There, we all know people where they do it way too often. You don't need a new kitchen every 10 years, in my humble opinion. But, <laughs> um, but some people need a, a boost. Paying down the mortgage versus investing elsewhere. That's a really interesting one. Generally speaking, I recommend paying down the mortgage. And that's got more obvious again lately because mortgage rates have started going back up again. Um, you, you've got to make more money on the investment than the interest rate on the mortgage is, is basically the equation. And when, when mortgages were down at about 3%, people were saying, well, I can make more than 3% on my investments. Um, so then it became a bit more... It's, and it's not, there's not a clear cut answer to those. If you're comparing it with KiwiSaver, you, you should be in KiwiSaver enough to get maximum from the government and your employer, rather than paying down the mortgage, because that's e the extra money coming in from them makes it a very powerful investment. But beyond that, generally speaking, it's a good idea to get rid of that debt. Those of us who have done it know how lovely it is, but you can always go back and borrow against it later, because you're a lot of security. And another example, um, a young parent said, I'm torn between wanting to enjoy the kids while they're young and wanting to help them financially when they're young adults. And so she was wondering about whether to, to do more work. I think she's working part-time. Um, and I always say, oh, look, think of the, the deathbed perspective. 
think about what, when you look back on your life, you're going to wish you spent more time with the, the little kids when they were little, I think. Um, so it's not all about money all the time by any means, it's about living life as well. This was just, just a couple more slides here. Um, Ski in your retirement, many of you will have heard of that, S-K-I, it stands for Spend Kids Inheritance. And, um, and, you know, the boom is attending to do that, whereas our parents didn't. The, this husband wrote in at 85, and he said, over a period of about 17 years, we roamed, just roamed. We visited around 70 countries, lived in a few for a few months at a time, and in the last decade before my wife died, we often spent six months overseas. We really rigidly planned our journeys, just went enjoying them and improvised. <coughs> and, he, and then he went on to say how he financed it, partly by renting their house out. They'd go over and live overseas for six months and rent their house out while they did it. And it's, it was, it's a wonderful example of getting in there and enjoying your retirement early in your retirement. I get a few letters from people who are 85, 90 saying, should have spent more when I was first retired and I was healthy enough to go and do it. Pe people get scared at that stage of their lives. They think, oh, oh, I'm going to run out of money. But by the time you get to 85 or 90, a lot of people say New Zealand soup is enough. They, they're just not going out that much. If you've got a mortgage-free home, that is. Mm -hmm. Not going out that much and wishing they had spent more, done like this couple did, gone out and lived life. There's, a, there's obviously a happy medium on all these things, but it's something worth thinking about. Um, so get in there, don't forget the treats, the windfalls, the, achieve, the, the achieving goals. Um, it's not all about holding on and saving every last penny. Um, just a very quick look through this book. It's got five parts, and you can buy copies as, as you're leaving if you like, from the lovely ladies around the corner who've got them to sell here. Um, part one's about the basics, savers, spenders, um, etc. House prices. Part two is about investments, um, more on which Kiwi Saver provider, mm -hmm. what I talked about tonight, um, getting the best from the scheme, shares and share funds, rental property, etc. Um, part three is strategy, so investing is paid on mortgage, rules to invest by, timing, etc. Part four about heading towards retirement and making your money work in retirement. And then part five, which is the part I like the best, is the people stuff where there's all these complications that come into people's lives and where, where the rules aren't always there to be exactly followed. So can this marriage be saved is an interesting one and a bit about trust and, and so on. So that's that. And then there's my other book, which um, popped the bestseller list for seven weeks. I was very lucky with that. Uh, that was a couple of years back. That also for sale around the corner. That was my earlier book, which has got eight steps to financial success in there, starting with just getting started and paying down high interest debt. So I'll do that first. But then the other steps going through. But it's in the context of looking at the relationship between money and happiness. Um, because when the publishers came to me and said, Would you write this book? I said, I don't want a book that says Money's good and more money's better, and lots and lots of money is the best of all. Because it's not, it isn't the way it really is, and lots of the research shows that. And so, so I write about that at the beginning and end of the book about the relationship between money and happiness. And um, so that's the the yellow book, which is for people more who don't know anything much about money. Lots of people my age buy copies for their kids of this book, and then the children, <coughs> adult children tend to write back to my Herald column and say, I read your yellow book and I want to know, you know a bit more about whatever. Um, so for people that don't know much, that's probably the better book. But if you know a bit, and most of you probably do, who bothered to come along here tonight, you might find the red book, where you're learning um, some of the sort of more subtle financial stuff sometimes through reading the stories, and so it makes it more fun, if you like. It's more interesting to read. Um, okay, main points from tonight, uh, the relationship between risk and return. So if you're going to go for higher returns, there's more risk. Good and bad years for all assets. So you just keep that in mind, own lots of shares, etc. Don't panic and move when the markets go down. Avoid trading and timing. Um, and Kiwi Saver, get the right risk level for you. Ignore past returns, go for low fees. Um, 
Get your investment right and leave them alone. Um, that's, yeah, it's such a key message. It's, if you just once read the books and get, get it all set up properly, then you can actually read novels. That's what I, people are always saying to me, oh, what do you think of so-and-so's latest book about money? And I say, I haven't read it. I've, and I'm in the middle of reading Elena Ferranti at the moment. Uh, some of you will have read, um, much more important. But once you get your money right, you really don't have to be absorbed in it. It's not, it's not good. Spending time on it's actually a bad thing. So okay, fi one final thought. What do you reckon I'm, what we're, what we're <coughs> looking at here? So I've got something where you start at a certain level when you're 18 to 19, and then it goes down, and then it starts around middle age to go back up again. Happiness. Happiness, happiness absolutely. It's happiness, yeah, it's, it's some, um, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the, the research, um, and, and the research finds that, that people who have more than a certain amount of money, their happiness levels go down as well. So there's an age thing going on, which is a lovely positive graph to look at. When, when I used to lecture at Auckland Uni and show this to the students, a lot of them were really amazed because they thought they were happy, yeah, and then it went down to their parents, so they sort of just kept on going down from then on, till you died very unhappy. And um, I used to look at it and they'd say, now how old are your parents? Are they around 40, 45, 49, 50, 54? Why are they unhappy? Could it be because of the way you're behaving? <laughs> but, um, but it's a nice comforting, comforting graph to read. Okay, questions and comments? I don't know how we're doing for time. Oh, we're a bit late. Sorry, but yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm currently a uni student, yeah. and uh, I've got some cash in the bank. Yeah. And uh, I'm basically, like you said, I currently I gradually trying to put money into the ETFs and all that stuff, right? Yes, yeah, good. Uh, so do, do you have any, like, what kind of percentage should I put in the ETFs uh, compared to the money in the bank? Moving it from the bank and yeah. investments. There's no sort of magic amount, but okay. if you, do you, is it money that you can, can tie up for 10 years or more is the key Yeah, thing. I'm planning like possibly getting a house, first yeah. house like at the end of the, like in 10 years. In, in about, so if it's 10 years or, yeah. or more, oh, yeah. then you can take high risk. Yeah. And I, if I were you, if you're really sure you're happy to tie it up for that long, you could move it all into oh. the share fund now if yeah. you want to. Yeah, or you might want to do, as I said, divide it into say three lots and do some now and some in a month and some in two months just yeah. to space it out a bit. But no real need to spread it out for too long, oh. really. Yeah, but don't forget when it goes down, leave it there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anything? Was there one more question? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say for just an observation that I made from one graph yes. that you put up there. Thank you very much because that sort of settled me down a little bit. I'm over retirement age, yeah. uh, and the last few months, I did the worst thing I uh, contacted my phone and I said, whoa, okay. That's gone down pretty dramatically. Yes. But like you were saying, when you average it out over the years, and I did a quick calculation from 1987 to 2020, yes. the positives were one thirty one percent the negatives, if my maths is right, were 154%. Oh. Now, obviously, that's relative to when the positives and the negatives are yes. in that equation. In yeah. other words, is it at the start or is it all at the end? But, I mean, you're still in the positive 23%. Yeah. So, over 33 years, you've made quite a lot of money. Yes. Yeah, and so, you sort of eased me off just showing me that one oh, graph. Right. If you're going to spend it within 10 years, start moving, moving it down to lower risk because it's too big a chance when you want to spend it. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the pension, right, yes. so I'm not touching it. But I did listen to you the other day saying, um, hold that for at least five years, don't, don't do anything. So we were just talking about this the other night. When do I want to touch this money? Because obviously we want to enjoy our lives. We yes. love them out to want to go tramping, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So are you saying that I should be looking at investing those higher risk things into lower risk? 
I'm, I'm now. saying um, two things. One, you, if, it, if it's money you think you'll spend 10 years or more away, yeah. regardless of your age, it's still a good idea to keep it in high risk as long as you can stomach the ups and downs. Okay, yeah. The yeah. other thing is, I, this sounds awful, but in both my books there's a lot about setting up your money for retirement and during retirement, so if you want to buy one, we'll yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no worries. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Here, we probably need to wrap up. I yes. think they're getting ready to lock us out. But um, yeah. thank you so much. The, the year wait has been well worth it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming tonight. And I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't thank AMZ for sponsoring us tonight. Thank you, AMZ. I don't